Calling all cars. A copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Phoenix Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 166. Be on the lookout for a gang of safe floors known to be operating in this district. Pick up any suspicious characters seen lording near large stores. That's all. time after time about our sponsor's product. What stands out most prominently in your mind about Rio Grande cracked gasoline? The Rio Grande cracked gasoline powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment than any other brand. That is to say, in the Rio Grande territory. Yes. Mr. McNear, you've got a detective's memory for details. Do you recall some of the cities that have used Rio Grande cracked gasoline? Well, Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Fresno, Santa Barbara, San Diego. And, and last week you mentioned three new ones. Pasadena, Phoenix, and another town up north. One of Mark Twain's towns. Uh, Marysville. Is that right? That's right. And the counties? Oh, yes. Uh, Maricopa County, Arizona. Good. We mustn't forget Maricopa County, Arizona. Its sheriff's cars serve a third of the total population of Arizona. And then there's Santa Barbara County, Orange County, San Diego County, and many, many others. Mr. Lewis? Well, Rio Grande track gasoline gives police car performance in any car. Right. There's one more thing you gentlemen might have mentioned. The patented Sinclair cracking process. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is the only gasoline you can buy that is refined by this famous process. It breaks up gasoline to finer atoms. Makes it burn more readily, more completely. The Sinclair cracking process is the reason for police car performance. It is the reason for Rio Grande's popularity among city and county officials. To our listeners in, let me suggest you try Rio Grande cracked gasoline. See your nearest independent Rio Grande dealer tomorrow. <laughs> Tonight we take pleasure in presenting Captain John J. McGrath, Chief of Detectives of the Phoenix Police Department, Captain McGrath. Good evening. Tonight's dramatization of calling all cars is a very good illustration of the reason why three times losing law was put into effect. It used to be that a criminal could go out and commit a crime, and if it was caught, serve the sentence prescribed by law, therefore walk out of prison to resume his criminal activities at will. And knowing this, they figured that crime as a career was a good living, even their short interruption of six months or a year in jail. But three-time loser law puts away different perspective of the situation. When a man has caught a convicted and the judge learns that it is his third offense, that man goes to Falston, and he goes for life. He knows when he goes that he has no chance of a parole. If this law has been in effect, when the chief criminal in tonight's story became to his operation, a great deal of time and money would have been saved. <laughs> For burglary by Bakersfield, Sutter County, Shasta County, San Joaquin County, and Utah Police. Committed and released from state penitentiaries in Omaha and Milwaukee. From Folsom and McNeil's Island for robbery and receiving stolen property. Return to McNeil's Island in 1920 for post office robberies at Anderson and Ripslippon, California. Released in 1923 and three months later sent to Utah State Penitentiary for receiving stolen property. Such is the record of 31-year-old, one-eyed John Sagatti, when in the spring of 1927 he dropped off a freight train to find himself in Glendale, Arizona. Badly in need of some food after the long, cold boxcar journey, his first stop is a small, greasy spoon restaurant. Ham and eggs, a pair, straight up on the eggs, a pair of ham, two are warm, 
catch you. Yes, sir. What'll it be? A cup of coffee to start with. One cup of java. Coming up. Hey, Eddie, how about a little service over here? Be right with you. There you are, mister. Thanks. You figured out what you want to eat yet? Yeah, give me a waffle and a couple strips of bacon on the way. Two strips of bacon with a waffle under them. Make that bacon crisp, will you? Find the pig. Is that all you want? Yeah. Okay. Hello, fella. Why don't you come in? Uh, just now, with the chance of a little food. Sure. What'll it be? Same old thing? No, uh, not tonight. I think I'll have a little of your lamb stew for a change and coffee. Okay. Cook's revenge on the dinner. Hey, Eddie, how about it? Okay, George. Sorry to keep you waiting. What can I do for you? Yeah. Mind if I look at some of that paper then? Huh? Oh, sure. Here. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah. You're making it hot for the bootleggers around here. There's a couple of fellas got a year apiece today. Well, for bootleggers? Yeah. Boy, can you imagine spending a year in jail for something like that? <laughs> Anybody that's dumb enough to turn to bootleg and ought to be sent up. Uh, what do you mean? Well, there's no big dough on that racket. Oh, I don't know about that. It seems to me there's plenty. No real dough. Well, I don't know what you call real dough, but I'd like to have what some of the big ones have made this last couple of years. Yeah, I can make more than those guys ever saw in six months. How do you do it? And I don't have to peddle liquor to do it. Huh? Oh. That's my business. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> I didn't mean to get personal. Uh, that's all right. Just forget it. Here you are. Waffle and bacon with a bacon crisp. How's my stew coming? Oh, yeah, I'll look into that. I'll have it here in a second. Yeah, what does the guy do around here for excitement? Oh, a little everything. Mostly play pool down at the pool hall. Pool, huh? <laughs> yeah, I haven't shot any pool for a long time. Well, I'm going down there tonight as soon as I finish eating. Why don't you drop in for a game? Oh, that is, if you, you want to. Yeah, I might do it at that. Yeah, if you want to, you can go down with me. I'll, I'll be through here about the same time you are. Okay, sounds swell. I don't know nobody here in town. Just got in. <laughs> I kind of go for a good game of rotation. Oh, fine, good enough. Seems we get through, we'll go over there. Ah, oh, here you are. Cook's revenge. Right out of the family stew bowl. Cook to perfection and uh, a whole lot of things I can't think of right now. John Sagotti and his newfound companion, whose name he learned is Stanley Borofsky, walk into a small pool hall, engage in a round of rotation. During the game, Sagotti seizes every opportunity to strengthen his friendship for Borofsky. And at the end of the third game, when Borofsky suggests it is time for him to go home, Sagotti suggests they have a drink together first. And a short time later, the two men stand before the bar of a tiny speakeasy. Well, here's how. Yep, right. <coughs> well, not bad. <laughs> well, what it is. Yeah, it's the best place in town. Hey, you live here in Glendale long? Yeah, just long enough to know the town fairly well. You work somewhere? Uh, <laughs> no. At the moment, I'm what you might call out of a job. Oh, well, that makes two of us. I'm in the same boat. Oh, uh, yeah? What's your business? My business? Yeah. What do you do when you're working? Well, <laughs> I guess you might call me an explosive expert. That is, if you have to call me anything. <laughs> An explosive expert. Yeah. I just heard him fall. You, you mean you go around blowing things up? Look, suppose we just skip the whole thing. You know, let it drop. <laughs> You're a funny sort of fellow. First you make a crack about money over the restaurant tonight, and then when I ask you what you mean, you, you freeze up. Now you do the same thing all over again. You right? still remember that remark about dough I made, huh? Sure, I do. As a matter of fact, I'd like to know what you meant by it. <laughs> I'm sort of curious that way. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, maybe if you told me your business, we could talk better, Mr. Barofsky, eh? Mm, well, uh, no. Yeah, you see? You want me to spill all about myself, but with you, it's different. No, 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 not exactly. That's no, only... you uh, don't want to talk in this place, is that it? Yeah, that's it. Well? See, look, I got a room up a little hotel. How would it be if we went over there? Well, Jake with me. Oh, uh, yeah, that... I don't know just why, but I got a feeling that bumping into each other the way we did was a piece of luck. Check. I got the same idea. Yeah, come on, man. Let's go out of here and go where we can talk without people. And a few minutes later in his hotel room, Stanley Borowski, 
29-year-old Russian listens with growing amazement as Sagotti unfolds his ideas on how to make big money without having to sell it. It's as simple as that. All you got to do is be careful and take your time planning the job. Then when you're all set, walk in and crack it. Yeah, but isn't cracking a safe a pretty hard thing to do? Nah. I tell you, I can blow the door off one of them and it won't even bust anything. Just open the door and that's all. Yeah, sounds easy, but I don't know. Never heard of anything like it before. Yeah, that's because you're green. I'm telling you, there's no one in the country that knows more about soup and how to use it than me, Johnny Zagatti. You know, it's funny how I just figured you out tonight. All of a sudden, uh, I knew we were going to get together. It was, well, uh, just like that. Yeah? Only we're not together yet. How do I know you'll go through with a job with me, huh? I don't know anything about you. Ah, listen, don't worry about me. I won't let you down. I'm not quite as green as you think. You ever been in jail? No. Well, that helps. No busybody coppers having a spot to them. Uh, sure, and I'm willing to take orders, too, uh, up uh, to a point. I don't know why, but I think you're all right. Suppose we get some sleep, and tomorrow we'll talk some more about it, huh? I got an idea that maybe you and me can make a nice bit of dough. But first, I gotta be sure. About you, I mean. <laughs> Apparently, Borowski convinces Sagotti of his sincerity. For a month later in a small shack on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. Now, here's the gag. I've got a joint spotted that looks right. But we've got a little bit of casing to do on it before we crack it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where is it? On the corner of 10th and McDowell. That's pay and take it store. They do a good business. As I'm plenty wrong, there's a nice wad in that safe all the time. Yeah, but how are we going to get in? Well, I got that all figured. The cinch. The only thing we've got to watch out for are those merchant patrol guys. That's the first thing you've got to do. Hang around until you find out how many of them there are and when they make their round. And how do I do that? By using your eyes. Nobody's going to notice you if you're careful. And if they do, what do you think i got those deputy sheriff badges for, huh? All you got to do is flash your buzzer and say you're looking for someone. Uh, okay. I'll go over to town the first thing in the morning. That's the idea. While you're doing that, I'm going to see where I can get a little nitro and some fuel. That's all we need, the way I do things. Safe full of dough, little soup. My experience, and we'll be sitting pretty. Accordingly, every day for the following week, Borowski loiters near the pay and take it. Keeps an accurate check on the merchant's patrolman's routine visits. While Zagotti secures the needed nitroglycerin and fuses. And at last, at 3 a.m., June 23rd, a large truck rolls to a stop in front of the store. Two men climb out, walk to the front door. You got the stuff with you? Yeah. Okay. Keep an eye out while I give you this door. Okay. 
Okay, I got all the money there is in there. Yeah, then there's nothing stopping us. Come on, let's go. And early the following morning, back in town, a puzzled store manager stands before the place where his face should be. Puts two and two together and hurry holds the police. And responding to the call, two detectives arrive. Listen to his story. I tell you, Lieutenant, it's not possible. I saw that safe when I left here last night, and now this morning it's, it's gone. Obviously. Did you notice anything else wrong before you found the safe missing? Nothing. How about the doors, windows they've been tampered with? Well, I didn't open up myself, but if there had been anything like that, I'm sure the boy who did open would have told me. Uh-huh. Where's that boy now? Why, uh, he's around here somewhere. Uh, yes, yes, that's him over there, uh, by the cash register. I think we'd better have a talk with him, Ed. Uh, you don't think one of my own men had anything to do with this, do you? I wouldn't know. But it's a sense that in order to carry that safe out of here, whoever did it will have to get in and out through something, a door or a window. And I can't figure anyone boosting a safe through a window, can you? Well, now that you put it that way, I, I can't. No. All right. Well, let's talk to that boy. Uh, Jim. Yes, sir? Uh, come over here a minute, will you? Yes, sir. What is it? Uh, Jim, these two gentlemen are detectives. Uh, they want to ask you a few things. Why, okay. It's all right with me. Jim, I understand you opened up this morning. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did you notice anything unusual about any of the doors? No, sir. That is nothing except... The... Say, wait a minute. There was one thing. The front door seemed to be kind of loose on its hinges when I unlocked it. Well, loose on the hinges, eh? Yes, sir. Only... <laughs> I didn't think much about it at the time. Come on, Ed. Let's take a look at that door. There's just a chance that we'll find some fingerprints. Then we'd better call the station and get a description of the safe and start the boys out looking for it. Right. So the Phoenix police start the job of locating one missing safe. Hope to find some clue as to the identity of the burglars. And two hours after a description of the safe is phoned to headquarters... The phone and the burglar detail comes to life. Burglary detail, Wade speaking. Uh, Wade, it's North. I think we found your missing safe. Is that right? Where? Out near the old schoolhouse. Good enough. One of the neatest jobs in safe running I've ever seen. The door is blown up and the money's gone, but it's hardly hurt the safe with that. All right, North. You stay there and we'll get out as fast as possible. Don't let anyone touch it. Might get some fingerprints. Okay, the finger. <laughs> Formed of the discovery, Chief of Detective John J. McGrath, accompanied by Wade and Detective Eddie Moore, rushed to the canal bank, make a complete examination of the blown face. But after a minute inspection, they find that there are no fingerprints, no clues of any sort that might help identify the criminal. The only thing they do agree upon is that this is the work of an expert. Accordingly, returning to headquarters, McGrath notifies all patrolmen to keep a sharp lookout for the suspicious characters, gives orders to his men to round up all known petty racketeers in the city. Try to learn if any newcomers are in town. But after two weeks of extensive investigation, the police find themselves with nothing to go on. No lead at all to the criminal. It is 2.30 in the morning, July 20th, one month after the pay and take it robbery. In a small office located in the Sun Mercantile Company at 616 South 7th Avenue, two men converse in low tone. Listen to the high whine of an electric drill. How is it? All right. Be through in a second. You got the crack soap? Yeah, off at the top where you're working. Okay. That's you know, I got to laugh when I think how we fooled the cops in this town. That crack in the papers last week about the pay and take a job. Haven't been done by a gang of eastern safe blowers. <laughs> and about the police being convinced they'd left town. Yeah, we got them up a tree, all right. There she goes. Now, keep this still. Now, Loader. Yeah, okay. I got to care for that water on the floor. Don't get the cord in it, or we'll short the works. Oh, yeah, I see it. Here you are. Okay. Now we pour in a little. Like this. Not too much. Just the right amount. And it's primed. You got the fuse? Oh, yeah, trace. Oh, oh, what's the matter? Oh, I dropped it in that puddle of water. Well, that's swell. It's the only piece we've got. Well, hell, I couldn't help it. It just dropped. All right, there's no use crying about it now. We'll just have to go and get some more. Let's take it an awful kiss. Sure, but what else can we do? We can't blow a safe without a fuel. Okay, okay. don't get hot about it. I'm not getting hot. Come on, let's stop cabin and get back to Mods. Sneaking out of the store, the Guardian Borowski make a hurried trip back to their hideout. But 
small shack on the outskirts of town. There they secured more fuse and returned to finish the uncompleted job. But as they entered the office again... Hey, will you look at that? I thought you said you soaked the cracks right. Why, I did. Well, then how come the suit's all run out? Look on the floor there. Oh, yeah, I see it. That means we'll have to load her all over again. More time, Lord. Well, come on, let's get started. Doesn't you get us in where to stand around here, aren't you? Uh, maybe you're right. I'll take some more soap and stuff it in the cracks. Make sure it's in tight. I'll super again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now she's loaded. I need a fuse and don't drop it. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Yeah? You're not going to see him. 
because I'm sending you up for a nice long stretch for those two jobs you pulled. And if you've got any idea that you're going to get out of it, just forget it. Because you're going right where you belong. Florence Penitentiary. In September of the same year, John Sagatti and Stanley Borowski were sentenced to from two to ten years in the Florence Penitentiary. Sagatti escaped from the there in 1929, but his liberty was short, and he was returned in less than a month. Released on parole a year later, he lost no time in returning to his old habits, and in 1930 was arrested in Miami after being shot during an attempted robbery. Borowski was also paroled, but he had learned his lesson and is now living a respectable life somewhere in the Midwest. Thank you, Captain McGrath. Independent Rio Grande dealers had a good year in 1936. From all over the Rio Grande territory, reports show sales increases for both Rio Grande cracked gasoline and Sinclair motor oil. And the new year has started off most favorably. For all this, the Rio Grande Oil Company is grateful to you calling all cars fans who have shown your loyalty to the dealers making these broadcasts possible. We hope you will continue to derive pleasure from calling all cars broadcasts and we hope you will continue to derive increased motoring satisfaction from the products of Rio Grande dealers. Rio Grande Crack, the gasoline of police car performance, Sinclair Pennsylvania Motor Oil, and Sinclair Opaline, two thoroughly de waxed, de jellied lubricating oil. Both refinery sealed in tamper proof cans. Why not tell your friends about these superior products? We hope, too, you will continue to be entertained by calling all cars news. That bright, newsy publication so full of screen and radio gossip, detective stories, and other special features. It's about time for a new issue. Keep in touch with your independent Rio Grande dealer. Cancellation broadcast 166 regarding safe robberies. Suspect this case now in custody. That's all.